The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1, The Woman in the Big Hat, by Baroness Emma Ozy, Part 1. Lady Molly always had the idea that if the finger of fate had pointed to Mathis's in Regent Street, rather than to Lyons, as the most advisable place for us to have a cup of tea that afternoon, Mr. Calden would be alive at the present moment. My dear lady is quite sure, and needless to say that I share her belief in herself, that she would have anticipated the murderer's intentions and thus prevented one of the most cruel and callous of crimes which were ever perpetrated in the heart of London. She and I had been to a matinee of Trilby, and were having tea at Lyons, which is exactly opposite Mathis's Vienna Café in Regent Street. From where we sat, we commanded a view of the street and of the café, which had been very crowded during the last hour. We had lingered over our toasted muffin until past six, when our attention was drawn to the unusual commotion which had arisen both outside and in the brilliantly lighted place over the road. We saw two men run out of the doorway and return a minute or two later in company with a policeman. You know what is the inevitable result of such a proceeding in London. Within three minutes a crowd had collected outside Mathis's. Two or three more constables had already assembled and had some difficulty in keeping the entrance clear of intruders. But already my dear lady, keen as a pointer on the scent, had hastily paid her bill, and without waiting to see if I followed her or not, had quickly crossed the road, and the next moment her graceful form was lost in the crowd. I went after her, impelled by curiosity, and presently caught sight of her in close conversation with one of our own men. I have always thought that Lady Molly must have eyes at the back of her head. Otherwise, how could she have known that I stood behind her now? Anyway, she beckoned to me, and together we entered Mathis's, much to the astonishment and anger of the less fortunate crowd. The usually gay little place was indeed sadly transformed. In one corner, the waitresses, in dainty caps and aprons, had put their heads together and were eagerly whispering to one another, whilst casting furtive looks at the small group assembled in front of one of those pretty alcoves, which, as you know, line the walls all around the big tea room at Mathis's. Here two of our men were busy with pencil and notebook whilst one fair-haired waitress, dissolved in tears, was apparently giving them a great deal of irrelevant and confused information. Chief Inspector Saunders had, I understood, been already sent for. The constables, confronted with this extraordinary tragedy, were casting anxious glances towards the main entrance, whilst putting the conventional questions to the young waitress. And in the alcove itself, raised from the floor of the room by a couple of carpeted steps, the cause of all this commotion, all this anxiety, and all these tears, sat huddled up on a chair, with arms lying straight across the marble top table, on which the usual paraphernalia of afternoon tea still lay scattered about. The upper part of the body limp, backboneless, and awry, half propped up against the wall, half falling back upon the outstretched arms, told quite plainly its weird tale of death. Before my dear lady and I had time to ask any questions, Saunders arrived in a taxicab. He was accompanied by the medical officer, Dr. Townsend, who at once busied himself with the dead man, whilst Saunders went up quickly to Lady Molly. "'The chief suggested sending for you,' he said quickly. He was phoning you when I left. There's a woman in this case, and we shall rely on you a good deal. What has happened? asked my dear lady, whose fine eyes were glowing with excitement at the mere suggestion of work. I have only a few stray particulars, replied Saunders, but the chief witness is that yellow-haired girl over there. 
We'll find out what we can from her directly. Dr. Townsend has given us his opinion. The medical officer, who had been kneeling beside the dead man, now rose and turned to Saunders. His face was very grave. The whole matter is simple enough, so far as I'm concerned, he said. The man has been killed by a terrific dose of morphia, administered no doubt in this cup of chocolate, he added, pointing to a cup in which there still lingered the cold dregs of the thick beverage. But when did this occur? asked Saunders, turning to the waitress. I, I can't say, she replied, speaking with obvious nervousness. The gentleman came in very early with the ladies, somewhere about four. They made straight for this alcove. The place was just beginning to fill, and the music had begun. And where is the lady now? She went off almost directly. She had ordered tea for herself and a cup of chocolate for the gentleman, also muffins and cakes. About five minutes afterwards, as I went past their table, I heard her say to him, I'm afraid I must go now or Jay's will be closed, but I'll be back in less than half an hour. You'll wait for me, won't you? Did the gentleman seem all right then? Oh, yes, said the waitress. He had just begun to sip his chocolate and merely said, So long, as she gathered up her gloves and muff and then went out of the shop. And she has not returned since? No. When did you first notice there was anything wrong with this gentleman? Asked Lady Molly. Well, said the girl with some hesitation, I looked at him once or twice as I went up and down, for he certainly seemed to have fallen all of a heap. Of course, I thought that he had gone to sleep, and I spoke to the manageress about him, but she thought that I ought to leave him alone for a bit. Uh, then we got very busy, and I paid no more attention to him, until about six o'clock when most afternoon tea customers had gone, and we were beginning to get the tables ready for dinners. Then I certainly did think there was something wrong with the man. I called to the man address, and we sent for the police. And the lady who was with him at first, what was she like? Would you know her again? queried Saunders. I don't know, replied the girl. You see, I have to attend to such crowds of people of an afternoon. I can't notice each one. And she had on one of those enormous mushroom hats. No one could have seen her face, not more than her chin, unless they looked right under the hat. Would you know the hat again? asked Lady Molly. Yes, I think I should, said the waitress. It was black velvet and had a lot of plumes. It was enormous, she added, with a sigh of admiration and of longing for the monumental headgear. During the girl's narrative, one of the constables had searched the dead man's pockets. Among other items, he had found several letters addressed to Mark Culloden, Esquire, some with an address in Lombard Street, others with one in Fitzjohn's Avenue, Hampstead. The initials M.C., which appeared both in the hat and on the silver mount of a letter case belonging to the unfortunate gentleman, proved his identity beyond a doubt. A house in Fitzjohn's Avenue does not, somehow, suggest a bachelor establishment. Even whilst Saunders and the other men were looking through the belongings of the deceased, Lady Molly had already thought of his family, children, perhaps a wife, a mother, who could tell? What awful news to bring to an unsuspecting, happy family, who might even now be expecting the return of father, husband, or son, at the very moment when he laid murdered in a public place, the victim of some hideous plot or feminine revenge? As our amiable friends in Paris would say, it jumped to the eyes that there was a woman in the case, a woman who had worn a gargantuan hat for the obvious purpose of remaining unidentifiable when the question of the unfortunate victim's companion that afternoon came up for solution. And all these facts to put before an expectant wife or an anxious mother. As no doubt you have already foreseen, 
Lady Molly took the difficult task on her own kind shoulders. She and I drove together to Lorbury House, Fitzjohn's Avenue, and on asking of the manservant who opened the door if his mistress were at home, we were told that Lady Irene Cullen was in the drawing-room. Mine is not a story of sentiment, so I'm not going to dwell on that interview, which was one of the most painful moments I recollect having lived through. Lady Irene was young, not five-and-twenty, I should say petite and frail-looking, but with a quiet dignity of manner which was most impressive. She was Irish, as you know, the daughter of the Earl of Athyville, and it seems had married Mr. Mark Culloden in the teeth of strenuous opposition on the part of her family, which was as penniless as it was aristocratic. Whilst Mr. Culloden had great prospects and a splendid business, but possessed neither ancestors nor high connections. She had only been married six months, poor little soul, and from all accounts must have idolized her husband. Lady Molly broke the news to her with infinite tact, but there it was. It was a terrific blow, wasn't it, to deal to a young wife, now a widow? And there was so little that a stranger could say in these circumstances. Even my dear lady's gentle voice, her persuasive eloquence, her kindly words, sounded empty and conventional in the face of such appalling grief. 2. Of course, everyone expected that the inquest would reveal something of the murdered man's inner life, would in fact allow the over-eager public to get a peep into Mr. Mark Culden's secret orchard wherein walked a lady who wore abnormally large velvet hats, and who nourished in her heart one of those terrible grudges against a man which can only find satisfaction in crime. Equally, of course, the inquest revealed nothing that the public did not already know. The young widow was extremely reticent on the subject of her late husband's life, and the servants had all been fresh arrivals when the young couple, just home from their honeymoon, organized their new household at Lorbury House. There was an old aunt of the deceased, a uh, Mrs. Steinberg, who lived with the Caldens, but who at the present moment was very ill. Someone in the house, one of the younger servants probably, very foolishly had told her every detail of the awful tragedy. With positively amazing strength, the invalid thereupon insisted on making a sworn statement, which she desired should be placed before the coroner's jury. She wished to bear solemn testimony to the integrity of her late nephew, Mark Calden, in case the personality of the mysterious woman in the big hat suggested to evilly disposed minds any thought of scandal. Mark Calden was the one nephew whom I loved, she stated with solemn emphasis. I have shown my love for him by bequeathing to him the large fortune which I inherited from the late Mr. Steinberg. Mark was the soul of honor, or I should have cut him out of my will as I did my other nephews and nieces. I was brought up in the Scotch home, and I hate all this modern fastness and smartness, which are only other words for what I call profligacy. Needless to say, the old lady's statement, solemn though it was, was of no use whatsoever for the elucidation of the mystery which surrounded the death of Mr. Mark Colden. But as Mrs. Steinberg had talked of other nephews, whom she had cut out of her will in favor of the murdered man, the police directed inquiries in those various quarters. Mr. Mark Colden certainly had several brothers and sisters, also cousins, who at different times, usually for some peccadillo or other, seemed to have incurred the wrath of the straight-laced old lady. But there did not appear to have been any ill-feeling in the family owing to this. Mrs. Steinberg was the sole mistress of her fortune. She might just as well have bequeathed it in toto to some hospital as to one particular nephew whom she favored, and the various relations were glad, on the whole, that the money was going to remain in the family rather than be cast abroad. 
The mystery surrounding the woman in the big hat deepened as the days went by. As you know, the longer the period of time which elapses between a crime and the identification of the criminal, the greater the chance the latter has of remaining at large. In spite of strenuous efforts and close questionings of every one of the employees at Mathis's, no one could give a very accurate description of the lady who had tea with the deceased on that fateful afternoon. The first glimmer of light on the mysterious occurrence was thrown about three weeks later by a young woman named Catherine Harris, who had been parlor-maid at Lorbury House when first Mr. and Lady Irene Culloden returned from their honeymoon. I must tell you that Mrs. Steinberg had died a few days after the inquest. The excitement had been too much for her enfeebled heart. Just before her death, she had deposited 250 pounds with her banker, which sum was to be paid over to any person giving information which would lead to the apprehension and conviction of the murderer of Mr. Mark Culloden. This offer had stimulated everyone's zeal, and I presume had aroused Catherine Harris to realization of what all the while had been her obvious duty. Lady Molly saw her in the chief's private office, and had much ado to disentangle the threads of the girl's confused narrative. But the main point of Harris's story was that a foreign lady had once called at Lorbury House about a week after the master and mistress had returned from their honeymoon. Lady Irene was out at the time, and Mr. Culden saw the lady in his smoking room. She was a very handsome lady, explained Harris, and was beautifully dressed. Did she wear a large hat? asked the chief. I don't remember if it were particularly large, replied the girl. But you remember what the lady was like? suggested Lady Molly. Yes, pretty well. She was very, very tall and very good looking. Would you know her again if you saw her? rejoined my dear lady. Oh, yes, I think so, was Catherine Harris's reply. Unfortunately, beyond this assurance, the girl could say nothing very definite. The foreign lady seems to have been closeted with Mr. Culden for about an hour, at the end of which time Lady Irene came home. The butler being out that afternoon, it was Harris who let her mistress in, and as the latter asked no questions, the girl did not volunteer the information that her master had a visitor. She went back to the servants' hall, but five minutes later the smoking-room bell rang, and she had to run up again. The foreign lady was then in the hall alone, and obviously waiting to be shown out. This Harris did, after which Mr. Calden came out of his room, and in the girl's own graphic words, he went on dreadful. I don't know if I'd done anything so very wrong, she explained, but the master seemed quite furious and said I wasn't a proper parlor maid or I'd have known that visitors must not be shown in straight away like that. I ought to have said that I didn't know if Mr. Calden was in that I would go and see. Oh, he did go on at me, continued Catherine Harris volubly. And I suppose he complained to the mistress, for she gave me notice the next day. And you have never seen the foreign lady since? concluded Lady Molly. No, she never come while I was there. By the way, how do you know she was foreign? Did she speak like a foreigner? Oh, no, replied the girl. She did not say much, only asked for Mr. Calden, but she looked French-like. This unanswerable bit of logic concluded Catherine's statement. She was very anxious to know whether, if the foreign lady was hanged for murder, she herself would get the 250 pounds. On Lady Molly's assurance that she certainly would, she departed in apparent content. 3. Well, we are no nearer than we were before, said the chief, with an impatient sigh, when the door had closed behind Catherine Harris. "'Don't you think so?' rejoined Lady Molly blandly. 
do you consider that what we have heard just now has helped us to discover who was the woman in the big hat? retorted the chief somewhat testily. Perhaps not, replied my dear lady with her sweet smile, but it may help us discover who murdered Mr. Calden. With which enigmatical statement she effectively silenced his chief and finally walked out of his office, followed by her faithful Mary. Following Catherine Harris's indications, a description of the lady who was wanted in connection with the murder of Mr. Calden was very widely circulated, and within two days of the interview with the ex-parlor maid, another very momentous one took place in the same office. Lady Molly was at work with the chief over some reports, whilst I was taking shorthand notes at a side desk, when a card was brought in by one of the men, and the next moment, without waiting either for permission to enter or to be more formally announced, a magnificent apparition literally sailed into the dust-covered little back office, filling it with an atmosphere of Parma violets and Russia leather. I don't think that I have ever seen a more beautiful woman in my life. Tall, with a splendid figure and perfect carriage, she vaguely reminded me of the portraits one sees of the late Empress of Austria. This lady was, moreover, dressed to perfection, and wore a large hat adorned with a quantity of plumes. The chief had instinctively risen to greet her, whilst Lady Molly, still and placid, was eyeing her with a quizzical smile. "'You know who I am, sir,' began the visitor as soon as she had sunk gracefully into a chair. "'My name is on that card. My appearance, I understand.' tallies exactly with that of a woman who is supposed to have murdered Mark Culloden. She said this so calmly, with such perfect self-possession, that I literally gasped. The chief, too, seemed to have been metaphorically lifted off his feet. He tried to mutter a reply. Oh, don't trouble yourself, sir, she interrupted him with a smile. My landlady, my servant, my friends, have all read the description of the woman who murdered Mr. Culloden. For the past twenty-four hours I have been watched by your police. Therefore I have come to you of my own accord before they came to arrest me in my flat. I'm not too soon, am I? She asked with that same cool indifference, which was so startling, considering the subject of her conversation. She spoke English with a scarcely perceptible foreign accent, but I quite understood what Catherine Harris had meant when she said that the lady looked French-like. She certainly did not look English, and when I caught sight of her name on the card, which the chief had handed to Lady Molly, I put her down at once as Viennese. Miss Elizabeth Lonthal had all the charm, the grace, the elegance, which one associates with Austrian women more than with those of any other nation. No wonder the chief found it difficult to tell her that, as a matter of fact, the police were about to apply for a warrant that very morning for her arrest on a charge of willful murder. I know, I know, she said, seeming to divine his thoughts. But let me tell you at once, sir, that I did not murder Mark Culloden. He treated me shamefully, and I would willingly have made a scandal just to spite him. He had become so respectable and straight-laced. But between scandal and murder there is a wide gulf. Don't you think so, madam? She added, turning for the first time towards Lady Molly. Undoubtedly, replied my dear lady with the same quizzical smile. A wide gulf which, no doubt, Miss Elizabeth Lowenthal will best be able to demonstrate to the magistrate tomorrow," rejoined the chief, with official sternness of manner. I thought that, for the space of a few seconds, the lady lost her self-assurance at this obvious suggestion, the bloom on her cheeks seemed to vanish, and two hard lines appeared between her fine eyes. But, frightened or not, she quickly recovered herself and said quietly, "'Now, my dear sir, let us understand one another. I came here for that express purpose. 
I take it that you don't want your police to look ridiculous any more than I want a scandal. I don't want detectives to hang around my flat, questioning my neighbors and my servants. They would soon find out that I did not murder Mark Culloden, of course. But the atmosphere of the police would hang round me. And I, I prefer Parma violets, she added, raising a daintily perfumed handkerchief to her nose. Then you have come to make a statement? asked the chief. Yes, she replied. I'll tell you all I know. Mr. Calden was engaged to marry me. Then he met the daughter of an earl, and thought he would like her better as a wife than a simple Miss Lowenthal. I suppose I should be considered an undesirable match for a young man who has a highly respectable and snobbish aunt, who would leave him all her money only on the condition that he made a suitable marriage. I have a voice, and I came over to England two years ago to study English, so that I might sing in oratory at the Albert Hall. I met Mark on the Calais Dover boat when he was returning from a holiday abroad. He fell in love with me, and presently asked me to be his wife. After some demur, I accepted him. We became engaged. But he told me that our engagement must remain a secret, for he had an old aunt from whom he had great expectations, and who might not approve of his marrying a foreign girl, who was without connections and a professional singer. From that moment I mistrusted him, nor was I very astonished when gradually his affection for me seemed to cool. Soon after, he informed me quite callously that he had changed his mind and was going to marry some swell English lady. I didn't care much, but I wanted to punish him by making a scandal, you understand. I went to his house just to worry him, and finally I decided to bring an action for breach of promise against him. It would have upset him, I know, no doubt his aunt would have cut him out of her will. That is all I wanted, but I did not care enough about him to murder him. Somehow her tale carried conviction. We were all of us obviously impressed. The chief alone looked visibly disturbed, and I could read what was going on in his mind. As you say, Miss Lowenthal, he rejoined, the police would have found all this out within the next few hours. Once your connection with the murdered man was known to us, the record of your past and his becomes an easy one to pursue. No doubt, too, he added insinuatingly, our men would soon have been placed in possession of the one undisputable proof of your complete innocence with regard to that fateful afternoon spent at Mathis's cafe. What is that? she queried blandly. An alibi. You mean where was I during the time that Mark was being murdered in a tea shop? Yes, said the chief. I was out for a walk, she replied quietly. Shopping, perhaps? No. You met someone who would remember the circumstance, or your servants could say at what time you came in. No, she repeated dryly. I met no one, for I took a brisk walk on Primrose Hill. My two servants could only say that I went out at three o'clock in the afternoon and returned after five. There was silence in the little office for a moment or two. I could hear the scraping of the pen with which the chief was idly scribbling geometrical figures on his blotting pad. Lady Molly was quite still. Her large, luminous eyes were fixed on the beautiful woman who had just told us her strange story, with its unaccountable sequel, its mystery which had deepened with the last phrase which she had uttered. Miss Lowenthal, I felt sure, was conscious of her peril. I am not sufficiently a psychologist to know whether it was guilt or merely fear which was distorting the handsome features now, hardening the face and causing the lips to tremble. Lady Molly scribbled a few words on a scrap of paper, which she then passed over to the chief. Miss Lowenthal was making visible efforts to steady her nerves. That is all I have to tell you, she said. 
in a voice which sounded dry and harsh. I think I will go home now. But she did not rise from her chair and seemed to hesitate as if fearful lest permission to go were not granted her. To her obvious astonishment, and I must add to my own, the chief immediately rose and said, quite urbanely, I thank you very much for the helpful information which you have given me. Of course, we may rely on your presence in town for the next few days, may we not? She seemed greatly relieved, and all at once resumed her former charm of manner and elegance of attitude. The beautiful face was lit up by a smile. The chief was bowing to her in quite a foreign fashion, and in spite of her visible reassurance, she eyed him very intently. Then she went up to Lady Molly and held out her hand. My dear lady took it without an instant's hesitation. I, who knew that it was the few words hastily scribbled by Lady Molly, which had dictated the chief's conduct with regard to Miss Lowenthal, was left wondering whether the woman I loved best in all the world had been shaking hands with a murderess. End of The Woman in the Big Hat by Baroness Emma Ozy, Part 1 Recording by Janet, Marysville, Washington The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1, The Woman in the Big Hat, by Baroness Emma Ozy, Part 2 no doubt you will remember the sensation which was caused by the arrest of Miss Lowenthal on a charge of having murdered Mr. Mark Culloden by administering morphia to him in a cup of chocolate at Mathis's Café in Regent Street. The beauty of the accused, her undeniable charm of manner, the hitherto blameless character of her life, all tended to make the public take violent sides either for or against her and the usual budget of amateur correspondence, suggestions, recriminations, and advice poured into the chief's office in titanic proportions. I must say that, personally, all my sympathies went out to Miss Lowenthal. As I have said before, I am no psychologist, but I had seen her in the original interview at the office, and I could not get rid of an absolutely unreasoning certitude that the beautiful Viennese singer was innocent. The magistrate's court was packed, as you may well imagine, on that first day of the inquiry, and of course sympathy with the accused went up to fever pitch when she staggered into the dock, beautiful still, despite the ravages caused by horror, anxiety, fear, in face of the deadly peril in which she stood. The magistrate was most kind to her, her solicitor was unimpeachably assiduous. Even our fellows, who had to give evidence against her, did no more than their duty, and were as lenient in their statements as possible. Miss Lowenthal had been arrested in her flat by Danvers, accompanied by two constables. She had loudly protested her innocence all along, and did so still, pleading, Not guilty! in a firm voice. The great points in favor of the arrest were, firstly, the undoubted motive of disappointment and revenge against a faithless sweetheart, then the total inability to prove any kind of alibi, which under the circumstances certainly added to the appearance of guilt. The question of where the fatal drug was obtained was more difficult to prove. It was stated that Mr. Mark Culloden was director of several important companies, one of which carried on business as wholesale druggists. Therefore, it was argued that the accused, at different times and under some pretext or other, had obtained drugs from Mr. Culloden himself. She had admitted to having visited the deceased at his office in the city both before and after his marriage. Miss Lowenthal listened to all this evidence against her with a hard, set face, 
as she did also to Catherine Harris's statement about her calling on Mr. Culloden at Lorbury House, but she brightened up visibly when the various attendants at Mathis's cafe were placed in the box. A very large hat belonging to the accused was shown to the witnesses, but though the police upheld the theory that that was the headgear worn by the mysterious lady at the cafe on that fateful afternoon, the waitresses made distinctly contradictory statements with regard to it. Whilst one girl swore that she recognized the very hat, another was equally positive that it was distinctly smaller than the one she recollected, and when the hat was placed on the head of Miss Lowenthal, three out of four witnesses positively refused to identify her. Most of these young women declared that, though the accused, when wearing the big hat, looked as if she might have been the lady in question, yet there was a certain something about her which was different. With that vagueness, which is a usual and highly irritating characteristic of their class, the girls finally parried every question by refusing to swear positively either for or against the identity of Miss Lowenthal. There's something that's different about her somehow, one of the waitresses asserted positively. What is it that's different? asked the solicitor for the accused, pressing his point. I can't say, was the perpetual, maddening reply. Of course, the poor young widow had to be dragged into the case, and here, I think, opinions and even expressions of sympathy were quite unanimous. The whole tragedy had been inexpressibly painful to her, of course, and now it must have seemed doubly so. The scandal which had accumulated round her late husband's name must have added the poignancy of shame to that of grief. Mark Culloden had behaved as callously to the girl whom clearly he had married from interested family motives as he had to the one whom he had heartlessly cast aside. Lady Irene, however, was most moderate in her statements. There was no doubt that she had known of her husband's previous entanglement with Miss Lowenthal, but apparently had not thought fit to make him accountable for the past. She did not know that Miss Lowenthal had threatened a breach of promise against her husband. Throughout her evidence, she spoke with absolute calm and dignity, and looked indeed a strange contrast in her closely fitting, tailor-made costume of black serge and tiny black toque to the more brilliant woman who stood in the dock. The two great points in favor of the accused were, firstly, the vagueness of the witnesses who were called to identify her, and secondly, the fact that she had undoubtedly begun proceedings for breach of promise against the deceased. Judging by the latter's letters to her, she would have had a splendid case against him, which fact naturally dealt a severe blow to the theory as to motive for the murder. On the whole, the magistrate felt that there was not a sufficiency of evidence against the accused to warrant his committing her for trial. He therefore discharged her, and amid loud applause from the public, Miss Lowenthal left the court a free woman. Now, I know that the public did loudly and, to my mind, very justly, blame the police for that arrest which was denounced as being as cruel as it was unjustifiable. I felt as strongly as anybody on the subject, for I knew that the prosecution had been instituted in defiance of Lady Molly's express advice, and in distinct contradiction to the evidence which she had collected. When, therefore, the chief asked my dear lady to renew her efforts in that mysterious case, it was small wonder that her enthusiasm did not respond to his anxiety. That she would do her duty was beyond a doubt, but she had very naturally lost her more fervent interest in the case. The mysterious woman in the big hat 
was still the chief subject of leading articles in the papers, coupled with that of the ineptitude of the police, who could not discover her. There were caricatures and picture postcards in all the shop windows of a gigantic hat covering the whole figure of its wearer, only the feet and a very long and pointed chin protruding from beneath the enormous brin. Below was the device, Who is she? Ask the police? One day, it was the second since the discharge of Miss Lowenthal, my dear lady came into my room beaming. It was the first time I had seen her smile for more than a week, and already I had guessed what it was that had cheered her. "'Good news, Mary,' she said gaily. "'At last I've got the chief to let me have a free hand. Oh, dear, what a lot of argument it takes to extricate that man from the tangled meshes of red tape. What are you going to do?' I asked. Prove that my theory is right as to who murdered Mark Culloden, she replied seriously, and as a preliminary, we'll go and ask his servants at Lorbury House a few questions. It was then three o'clock in the afternoon. At Lady Molly's bidding, I dressed somewhat smartly, and together we went off in a taxi to Fitzjohn's Avenue. Lady Molly had written a few words on one of her cards, urgently requesting an interview with Lady Irene Culloden. This she handed over to the manservant, who opened the door at Lorbury House. A few moments later, we were sitting in the cozy boudoir. The young widow, high-bred and dignified in her tight-fitting black gown, sat opposite to us, her white hands folded demurely before her, her small head, with its very close coiffure, bent in closest attention towards Lady Molly. "'I most sincerely hope, Lady Irene,' began my dear lady, in her most gentle and persuasive voice, "'that you will look with all possible indulgence on my growing desire, shared, I may say, by all my superiors at Scotland Yard.' to elucidate the mystery which still surrounds your late husband's death. Lady Molly paused, as if waiting for encouragement to proceed. The subject must have been extremely painful to the young widow. Nevertheless, she responded quite gently. I can understand that the police wish to do their duty in the matter. As for me, I have done all, I think, that could be expected of me. I am not made of iron, and after that day in the police court, she checked herself, as if afraid of having betrayed more emotion than was consistent with good breeding, and concluded more calmly, I cannot do any more. I fully appreciate your feelings in the matter, said Lady Molly, but you would not mind helping us, would you? in a passive way, if you could, by some simple means, further the cause of justice? What is it you want me to do? asked Lady Irene. Only to allow me to ring for two of your maids and ask them a few questions. I promise you that they shall not be of such a nature as to cause you the slightest pain. For a moment I thought that the young widow hesitated. Then, Without a word, she rose and rang the bell. "'Which of my servants did you wish to see?' she asked, turning to my dear lady as soon as the butler entered in answer to the bell. "'Your own maid and your parlor maid, if I may,' replied Lady Molly. Lady Irene gave the necessary orders, and we all sat expectant and silent until, a minute or two later, Two girls entered the room. One wore a cap and apron, the other, in neat black dress and dainty lace collar, was obviously the lady's maid. This lady, said their mistress, addressing the two girls, wishes to ask you a few questions. She is a representative of the police. 
so you had better do your best to satisfy her with your answers. Oh, rejoined Lady Molly pleasantly, choosing not to notice the tone of acerbity with which the young widow had spoken, nor the unmistakable barrier of hostility and reserve which her words had immediately raised between the young servants and the representative of the police. What I am going to ask these two young ladies is neither very difficult nor very unpleasant. I merely want their kind help in a little comedy, which will have to be played this evening, in order to test the accuracy of certain statements made by one of the waitresses at Mathis's tea shop with regard to the terrible tragedy which has darkened this house. You will do that much, will you not? she added, speaking directly to the maids. No one can be so winning or so persuasive as my dear lady. In a moment I saw the girl's hostility melting before the sunshine of Lady Molly's smile. We'll do what we can, ma'am, said the maid. That's a brave good girl, replied my lady. You must know that the chief waitress at Mathis's has this very morning identified the woman in the big hat, who, we all believe, murdered your late master. Yes, she continued, in response to a gasp of astonishment, which seemed to go round the room like a wave. The girl seems quite positive, both as regards the hat and the woman who wore it. But, of course, one cannot allow a human life to be sworn away without bringing every possible proof to bear on such a statement. And I am sure that everyone in this house will understand that we don't want to introduce strangers more than we can help into the sad affair, which already has been brooded abroad too much. She paused a moment, then, as neither Lady Irene nor the maids made any comment, she continued, My superiors at Scotland Yard think it their duty to try and confuse the witness as much as possible in her act of identification. They desire that a certain number of ladies wearing abnormally large hats should parade before the waitress. Among them will be, of course, the one whom the girl has already identified as being the mysterious person who had tea with Mr. Culloden at Mathis's that afternoon. My superiors can then satisfy themselves whether the waitress is or is not so sure of her statement that she invariably picks out again and again one particular individual amongst a number of others or not. Surely, interrupted Lady Irene dryly, you and your superiors do not expect my servants to help in such a farce? We don't look upon such proceedings as a farce, Lady Irene, rejoined Lady Molly gently. It is often resorted to in the interest of an accused person, and we certainly would ask the cooperation of your household. I don't see what they can do. But the two girls did not seem unwilling. The idea appealed to them. I felt sure it suggested an exciting episode and gave promise of variety in their monotonous lives. I am sure both these young ladies possess fine big hats, continued Lady Molly with an encouraging smile. I should not allow them to wear ridiculous headgear, retorted Lady Irene sternly. I have the one your ladyship wouldn't wear and threw away interposed the young parlor-maid. I put it together again with the scraps I found in the dust-hole. There was just one instant of absolute silence, one of those magnetic moments when fate seems to have dropped the spool on which she was spinning the threads of a life and is just stooping in order to pick it up. Lady Irene raised a black bordered handkerchief to her lips and then said quietly, I don't know what you mean, Mary. I never wear big hats. No, my lady, here interposed the lady's maid. But Mary means the one you ordered at Sanchia's and only wore the once the day you went to that concert. Which day was that? 
asked Lady Molly blandly. Oh, I couldn't forget that day, ejaculated the maid. Her ladyship came home from the concert. I had undressed her, and she told me that she would never wear her big hat again. It was too heavy. That same day Mr. Culloden was murdered. That hat would answer our purpose very well, said Lady Molly quite calmly. Perhaps Mary will go and fetch it, and you had better go and help her put it on. The two girls went out of the room without another word, and there were we three women left facing one another, with that awful secret only half revealed, hovering in the air like an intangible specter. What are you going to do, Lady Irene? asked Lady Molly, after a moment's pause, during which I literally could hear my own heart beating, whilst I watched the rigid figure of the widow in deep black crepe, her face set and white, her eyes fixed steadily on Lady Molly. "'You can't prove it,' she said defiantly. "'I think we can,' rejoined Lady Molly, simply. "'At any rate, I mean to try. "'I have two of the waitresses from Mathis's outside in a cab, "'and I have already spoken to the attendant who served you at Sanchez, "'an obscure maligner in a back street near Portland Road.' We know that you were at great pains there to order a hat of certain dimensions and to your own minute description. It was a copy of one you had once seen Miss Lowenthal wear when you met her at your late husband's office. We can prove that meeting, too. Then we have your maid's testimony that you wore the same hat once and once only the day, presumably, that you went out to a concert. A statement? which you will find it difficult to substantiate, and also the day on which your husband was murdered. "'Bah! The public will laugh at you,' retorted Lady Irene, still defiantly. "'You would not dare to formulate so monstrous a charge. It will not seem monstrous when justice has weighed in the balance the facts which we can prove. Let me tell you a few of these.' the result of careful investigation. There is the fact that you knew of Mr. Culloden's entanglement with Miss Elizabeth Lowenthal, and did your best to keep it from old Mrs. Steinberg's knowledge, realizing that any scandal round her favorite nephew would result in the old lady cutting him, and therefore you, out of her will. You dismissed a parlor maid for the sole reason that she had been present when Miss Lowenthal was shown into Mr. Culloden's study. There is the fact that Mrs. Steinberg had so worded her will that, in the event of her nephew dying before her, her fortune would devolve on you. The fact that, with Miss Lowenthal's action for breach of promise against your husband, your last hope of keeping the scandal from the old lady's ears had effectually vanished. You saw the fortune eluding your grasp. You feared Mrs. Steinberg would alter her will. Had you found the means, and had you dared, would you not rather have killed the old lady? But discovery would have been certain. The other crime was bolder and surer. You have inherited the old lady's millions, for she never knew of her nephew's earlier peccadilloes. All of this we can state and prove, and the history of the hat, bought and worn one day only, that same memorable day, and then thrown away. A loud laugh interrupted her, a laugh that froze my very marrow. There is one fact you have forgotten, my lady of Scotland Yard, came in sharp, strident accents from the black-robed figure, which seemed to have been strangely spectral in the fast-gathering gloom which had been enveloping the luxurious little boudoir. Don't omit to mention the fact that the accused took the law into her own hands. And before my dear lady and I could rush to prevent her, Lady Irene Culloden had conveyed something, we dare not think what, to her mouth. "'Find Danvers quickly, Mary,' said Lady Molly calmly. "'You'll find him outside.' Bring her doctor back with you. Even as she spoke, Lady Irene 
with a cry of agony, fell senseless in my dear lady's arms. The doctor, I may tell you, came too late. The unfortunate woman evidently had a good knowledge of poisons. She had been determined not to fail. In case of discovery, she was ready and able to mete out justice to herself. I don't think the public ever knew the real truth about the woman in the big hat. Interest in her went the way of all things. Yet my dear lady had been right from beginning to end. With unerring precision, she had placed her dainty finger on the real motive and the real perpetrator of the crime, the ambitious woman who had married solely for money, and meant to have that money even at the cost of one of the most dastardly murders that have ever darkened the criminal annals of this country. I asked Lady Molly what it was that first made her think of Lady Irene as the possible murderess. No one else for a moment had thought her guilty. The big hat, replied my dear lady with a smile. Had the mysterious woman at Mathis's been tall, the waitresses would not, one and all, have been struck by the abnormal size of the hat. The wearer must have been petite, hence the reason that under a wide brim only the chin would be visible. I at once sought for a small woman. Our fellows did not think of that, because they are men. You see how simple it all was? End of The Woman in the Big Hat by Baroness Emma Ozy, Part 2 Recording by Janet, Marysville, Washington